Welcome at Eurotech. I am Bram Verschoor, Commercial Director of Euro Group. Today we will host our very first LOPAT webinar. So you're witnessing an historical moment. We will host this webinar in the all new LOPAT building. It's our technical center where we are at the moment. Eurotech is member of Euro Group, which is a family owned enterprise founded in 1996. We are equipment manufacturers. In Eurogroup, we have three different companies. First, TTA, which is our oldest company. TTA is market leader in equipment for handling and selection of young, fragile living plants. TTA produces equipment for selection of them and transferring of them. We supply this equipment to our clients all over this planet. Quite a few of them have numbers well exceeding a billion plants per year. Eurotron is another company in our group. Eurotron produces equipment for fabrication of back contact solar panels. Also in Eurotron we have clients in USA, in Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe. We develop the equipment, we develop the process, and we have a lab which accommodates pre-production, testing, uh, and all different activities which are needed for development. Our installed base is capable for production of around 7 million solar panels per year. So probably they are even on your own rooftop as we speak. But you are not here for TTA, not for Eurotron, you are here for Eurotech. Eurotech produces AGVs. Well, actually that's wrong. It's not an automated guided vehicle, but I would rather like to call it an AMR, Autonomous Mobile Robot. The LOPAT is much smarter than an average AGV, but you'll hear more about that at later stage. Let me take you at the first preview to show you some LOPATs. For your convenience, we have them driving around here. Just passing is the LOPAT S. Coming here is the Lopet L, it's the largest underwriter, still a very low frame. In the center you see our new baby, but actually it's not a baby, it's almost our largest Lopet, the Lopet F, capable for pellets. And over there in the corner you see the Lopet M. The common theme in what we do as a company is handling with vision assistance, motion with vision assistance. This applies both in TTA, in Eurotron, and in Eurotech. We combine motion with vision technology. Today, we will share our knowledge with you about the LOPAT system. And we dig a little bit deeper into the following topics. A, the LOPAT equipment, technical possibilities, technical features of the LOPAT. So basically, we will lift the hood and allow you to look below the bonnet in what's happening inside. We will also discuss with you about some applications and use cases, because it's not just a product with nice features. The product and the features have a purpose. And the purpose is to help our clients automating their production and saving money on their daily operations. We will end this webinar with a Q&A session. Feel free to add all your questions in the comment stream during this webinar. We will try to address your questions. However, given the number of people observing this webinar, we can imagine that not all your questions are addressed. Don't worry, we will address them in the comment stream later or Probably you'll visit our website, lopet.com, and connect by yourselves with us to drop your questions. So let's start our fourth, first part now. My colleague Jonathan will explain you more about the Lopet equipment range. Jonathan, the stage is yours. Thank you, Bram. I'm Jonathan Venedol. I'm a sales engineer at Eurotech. And in the next 15 minutes, I have the pleasure to tell you everything 
about the unique features of the LOPAD. I will start with the unique design of the LOPAD, and afterwards I will tell you more about the software. In the design of the LOPAD, uh, the different LOPAD types, uh, they, are, uh, they are all focused on transporting standardized load carriers, which are commonly used in many logistic environments. And the first LOPAD we developed is the LOPAD M. This one is specifically designed to move Danish trolleys, which are used a lot in the flower industry. However, it can uh, transport all elongated trolleys like picking carts. Uh, soon there became a need for a larger vehicle, uh, which is the Lopet L. The Lopet L is uh, able to transport square racks uh, or other load carriers with similar dimensions. In Europe, at least, we use a lot of roll cages in many, many environments, especially in the retail industry or post and parcel market, and that's why we have the Lopet S specifically designed of moving roll cages. For uh, smaller trolleys or dollies, we have the Lopet K, and the difference with the Lopet S is the width of the lifting table, which is a bit smaller. The Lopet P is a special one. It has no lifting mechanism. You can see it as a flexible conveyor. It can move your goods or totes uh, very quickly from A to B. And it can also be equipped with a uh, put-on drop-off station or a uh, conveyor. And last, but certainly not least, we have the Lopet F. This one is able to transport all your pallet types. It can be Euro pallets, block pallets, UK pallets, or pallet boxes. The Lopet P and F are currently in the latest testing phase. However, we want to give you a sneak preview of a test we did lately with the Lopet F. It shows that the Lopet F is capable of handling all types of pellets, and I am really enthusiastic about this. The next thing is a small footprint of the Lopet. The Lopet is designed in such a way that it's really small, and, that, um, and therefore it needs less space than other material handling equipment, like EPTs or forklift trucks. In this example, you see a turning radius of a Lopet F with a pellet, which is around 1.9 meter and a turning radius of a forklift truck with a pallet, which is 3.6 meters. And that's quite a big difference. There is one thing all lopeds have in common, and that's they are unique ultra-low. I dare to say that the lopet is the lowest AGV AMR on the market. And this has certainly a few benefits. The first benefit is, is that all existing trolleys, which are currently used in logistic environments, generally have a um, a height of 15 centimeter, a ground cleaners of 50 centimeters. So the Lopet is able to go in the need and pick them up. I forgot to say, but the Lopet M and L are 12.7 uh, centimeters high, and the, the lifting table of the Lopet S, K, and F only 10 centimeters. A second benefit of the ultra low design is that it ensures more storage space on your trolley. You can already start uh, putting your goods on a very low level. All lopeds are omnidirectional in their driving behavior. And here you see a bottom view of a lopet. And here I have one of these wheel sets. This is a differential drive. This means that the two different wheels can move in different direction at different speed. And that makes the lopet fully omnidirectional. What the benefit of this is, I will explain here. I have a small 3D design. The lopet it drives in front of a trolley, and the benefit of the omnidirectional driving behavior is that the lopet can adjust its orientation a bit, making sure that he connects well with the trolley. It's even possible when the, lo when the lopet is under a trolley that he also changes its orientation a bit if that's needed and picks up the trolley in the correct way. Another benefit is that the lopet can uh, maneuver in small spaces, and in this example, you see uh, the lopet goes sideways in an aisle using 1.6 meter um, instead of 
uh, that he turns in the aisle and then you need 1.8 meters. So this also ensures more efficient use of space. Now, so far, I can say our engineering team has done a great job. However, we also have a software team and they are also doing very well. First of all, they ensure that the low bed is safe. We have a certified safety system on board and this ensures that the low bed is collaborative. This means that the low bed can operate in an environment together with people or other material handling equipment. However, navigation is of course the most important thing of an autonomous mobile robot. And we can say that the low pad is able to navigate freely and almost in any environment without the need to change anything to the floor or the existing infrastructure. How this works, I will tell you in five minutes from now. And last, but certainly not least, we have our software suite. This is in-house development Lopet software consisting out of Lopet Navigator, Lopet Supervisor, Lopet Organizer and Lopet Simulator. A simulation software is being used to perform simulation studies if that is required for a certain application. Here you see an overview of the Lopet, of the Lopet software suite. It starts all with the Lopet Navigator. The Lopet Navigator takes care of navigation, lo localization and safety. Above that we have the Lopet uh, Supervisor, this is our Fleet Manager. Fleet Manager is taking care of the fleet management, so it's checking the battery status, it's checking the overall status of the Lopet. Um, it, it also has a dispatching function, meaning that it receives transport jobs from above-lying software and the Lopet Supervisor will send these jobs to the best possible Lopet and it will also take care of route management. Another part of this software is the warehouse layout configurator. So the map warehouse um, can be configured. So you can put your pathways, you can set the charging stations, the buffer stations, etc. We deliver a standard API. So that me means make sure that a, that a customer system, a WCS, ERP system, can connect with our supervisor and send us transport jobs. Now what is a transport job? I mean with this, uh, pick up trolley at position A1 and bring it to dock 5 B1. In a lot of instances we see that the customer system is not able to generate these jobs. And that's why you need uh, another software layer, which we call Lopet Organizer. And this is a custom integration layer. It depends per application uh, what kind of uh, software is required and who is taking care of this part. Now, I promised you that I will tell you more about our navigation technology and promises uh, are there to be kept. So that's what I will do here. We see here Lopet Navigator. We have three different technologies that make sure that the Lopet is very accurate and always knows where it is. And, the first, and it's always a combination between two technologies. Odometry with a LiDAR-based SLAM system or odometry with a floor detection camera. The floor detection camera is our preferred way of navigation. First, odometry. The sensors in the wheel sets know how fast the lopet is moving and in which direction, and this gives us the position of the lopet. However, this is not 100% accurate uh, as you have some uh, drift. So that's why we need a second technology. And this can be a LiDAR based SLAM system. This works as follows the robot. Uh, you, uh, maps its environment and simultaneously localizes itself in that environment. And it's using fixed objects in the environment to do this. This is great technology and almost all AMR AGV suppliers are using this. However, it's not working in dynamic environments. And with dynamic environments, I mean environments which are constantly changing. So this can be a, a marshalling area completely full with pallets, roll cages, but the next hour is completely empty, or a highway. That's exactly the reason why autonomous cars also use this technology, but also use other technology. And for that same reason, we also use another technology, which is a floor camera system. This works as follows. In the mapping phase, we map the floor. Um, we make really detailed pictures of the floor. We save the XI coordinate of that picture in their database. After that, the Lopet starts driving and he compares the, the pictures he made while driving with the pictures in the database. And when there is a ma match, we get an update of our exact location. 
Now, these are our technologies we use for navigation. I can understand that you probably also have some questions about the other software parts or about this technology. Please use the comment section for this. Um, in the next uh, minutes, my colleague Shoot will come onto the stage. He will tell more about the low-pad processes. I can understand you probably have a lot of thoughts how to use this great technology in your logistic environment, but we, we want to help you structure your thoughts and he will explain some potential processes the low-pad can be used. Sure, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Sjoerd Visser also responsible for sales, just as Jonathan. Jonathan explained to you a lot about the technical side of the LOPED. I will tell you more about the process side. Um, the technical side, easily said, just ensures that the LOPED can drive on a horizontal way from A to B. That, uh, that is simply said uh, the technical side. But what you can do with a low pad, what kind of process you can fulfill with a low pad, um, that all has to do with the software and the intelligence what we add to this software. To clarify a little bit the, the, uh, the processes which can be fulfilled with a low pad, we uh, made some animations for you and we distinguished uh, the following processes, inbound, a uh, cross-docking process, assisting the pickers in a person-to-goods or goods-to-person process and outbound process. First, we will look uh, with each other to the inbound process. I'll first show to you the uh, short animation and afterwards I will explain a little bit more to you. What you see here is the order picking for the inbound process. Um, yes, please. I have to be a little bit more patient. The main question we always get is how do the low pad know where it has to pick up the pallet and where it has to bring this pallet or roll cage? What you just saw was the, your forklift driver, the truck driver, or your warehouse employee already unloaded the truck and scans the barcode of a pallet, scans the position on the floor, so your WMS system knows on this position is this particular pallet. Through an interface, what we can make with your WMS system, the WMS system can tell our system then that this particular pallet has to be transported to, for instance, Highway Rack 15 on ground position 1. What you saw, the low pad goes to the pallet, lifts it up, bring it to the Highway Rack uh, aisle number 15 and put it on position 1 on the ground position. You can imagine that uh, you will have maybe a rich truck AGV or a normal reach truck, what can lift up the pallets from ground position and put it on a desired level in your high bay wrecking. Another process, what we uh, see in almost every warehouse is the cross docking process. Sometimes it's just a small process, other, other times it's a very big main process. Uh, for instance, in food retail, I think uh, you will face this mostly, maybe most on, uh, in a very big uh, regional uh, hubs where they have to cross dock the raw containers and split it out to all several destinations. 
first, again, the short animation. All right, what you just saw was um, almost similar as for an inbound process. Uh, this could work also for a cross docking process. The raw containers are unloaded just over the threshold of the dock. Your truck driver or your warehouse employee scans the raw container to a certain position on the floor. Your system knows exactly where this raw container is and can tell our system to which destination we have to bring this raw container. In this example, it's not then the a destination in your storage area, but it's a destination at another dock. Here we received the transport job to pick up the first raw container and transport it to, to another destination. Here you see that this can work uh, uh, simultaneously with other low pads that they all receive on the same time, several transport jobs and transport all these raw containers to the desired destinations. The other process well, where I want to look with you to is assisting pickers. Especially nowadays with the explosive growth in e-commerce uh, market, the demand for automation in a picking process is growing each day. First, we want to look to the goods to person process. I think maybe everybody of you in the audience uh, have seen videos of Amazon Robotics where a robot transport uh, squared storage racks in front of an uh, order picking station. In this example, you see uh, a rectangular uh, order, uh, storage rack, but um, yeah, you can imagine you can have all different kind of uh, storage racks and we can serve almost every uh, dimension with another low pad type. First, again, I will show to you the goods to person process. All right, what you saw here is the Lopet M collects the storage rack and transport this in front of the order picker. The order picker is consolidating the orders in similar racks what are, which are positioned in a half a circle around the order picker. And the order picker receives the orders with a voice picking system on its head. I think it's interesting to mention, uh, if you compare this to other solutions on the market, that with the, the, the benefit of the height of the low pad, especially, uh, uh, you can see it here, you can start already with storing your products on a very low level, and this can result sometimes in a storage increase of 20% of your storage. And that, makes, that can make a business case good or bad. 
Um, another interesting thing is we all also take a next step in this. We can bring the goods from storage to the order picker, but all these goods are consolidated in similar racks. We can transport these racks after consolidating the orders there to a packing station, or we can transport them to an outbound area. I can imagine that you maybe have your own goods to person ASRS system. Um, what we've seen by a lot of these systems that people are consolidating the orders on an order picking card like this. So if you have already a goods to person system, maybe you can think about to transport then the order picking cards from the picking area to a uh, packing area or to your uh, outbound area. The other process, what I want to tell more about is the person to goods. First, again, short the animation. All right, what you see here is that we disconnect the pick run from the order picker. The low pad starts from starting position of the uh, raw cage, drives to the first picking position. In the meantime, we directed the order picker to this position and uh, give the order picker with a voice picking system, but it can also be another a picking system, uh, a PDA or whatever. And we give the instruction to take a case, take some pieces from a box and put it in the raw cage which just arrived with a low pad. When it, the order pick confirmed the order pick, then he received from us the next nearest order line. This could be an order line for the same order in the same pick run, but it could also be an order line for an other pick run that this picker has to serve then afterwards another low pad. By cutting um, the pre-pick and the post-pick for the picker, we um, cut almost 30% of their working time. And by directing the picker in this uh, picking area on a very efficient way, we cut almost a half of their walking distance during picking. When you uh, get this 30% and a half of their walking distance during this picking, you will have almost 100% productivity gain by assisting your picker with a low pad in a person to goods order picking process. Almost every uh, logistic process ends then with the outbound process. Again, I will show you short an animation. So what you see here is that after the picking process, the low pads can bring the, the raw containers from this picking area to the marshalling area. When it's needed to bring first a raw cage to a position where you want to wrap this raw cage or uh, a packing area, it's also possible. After that, it still needs to be transported to your outbound area and that's what you saw just uh, saw happening here.
especially a marshalling area is a very wide area where you, uh, your workers have to walk a lot. And this is a very interesting um, part of your logistic process, what you can automate with the LOPAD. In this example, this is the LOPAD S, specially designed for these raw containers. Now I want to uh, show to you a short movie of one of our uh, very excited and satisfied customers and he will uh, tell you a little bit more about his journey with a low pet. In the meantime I'll ask you if you please want to add in the comments which low pet uh, is uh, for you most interesting low pet and what kind of process you have in mind what you want to fulfill with a low pet. Then now you will see a, a movie of two minutes for uh, of our uh, customer in KWS. Hi, we're here at KWS in Einbeck in Germany. Uh, my name is Ben Grub. I'm a scientist in the plant physiology department. KWS is a worldwide uh, breeding company. We breed crop plants. We have just over 5,000 employees. Today we're in our glasshouse facility here where we have our low pads uh, running. So we looked at quite a number of manufacturers for um, automated transport systems and we selected the LOPAD for uh, a couple of main reasons. The first of those was that the LOPAD is, is quite small and compact and that was very important for us because uh, we wanted to use the LOPADs in our glasshouse setting. We need to use this space very efficiently and the LOPAD is, is very compact, especially the height was a, very much a deciding factor. So essentially the LOPAD takes over um, this transport task which before humans were doing. So we have fairly heavy containers. Uh, it means that we can do the work more efficiently. We can move plants quicker around the, the area, but we can also do it much more safely. We don't have to lift uh, the containers as we did previously. So for us, it's um, safer and much more efficient use of the space and efficiency in the, in the process itself. Now, thank you all for your questions. We have received a lot of interesting questions and Bram and I will go through them. Uh, the first question, Bram, we got is how long can a LOPAD drive on one battery and how long is the charging time? Yeah, the amount of time it can drive on one battery is varying a little bit depending on the circumstances where you drive. You can imagine if your floor is a little bit more rough surface-wise or you have, if you have a very heavy payload or uh, many stops, so drop-off, pick-up, drop-off, pick-up and short drives, you ask more from the battery. So that is a little bit different. There is not a simple, simple guideline where you can say, hey, um, this is it. But in average, the factor between driving and charging is one to four and one to five. Okay. What does that mean in daily life? If you have a fully charged battery, you can drive about eight hours and then you need to charge about two or three hours. The charging time also depends on the ambient temperature. If it's a bit colder, we can charge faster. There is one thing more to consider here. Um, there is a possibility with a low pad to apply opportunity charging. Let me show you something here. This is a floor-based station. Every low pad is charging from the bottom side of the low pad. So when it's almost empty, it tells the supervisor, hey, 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 I'm in need, please give me some juice. Supervisor knows the charging station, it knows the direction of the low pad, and it will bring the low pad to the start charging station and drive it over it. There it will be parked until a certain threshold is made. This can be done in a process where we park the LOPADs temporarily and say, hey, 
you were parked when you were fully announced yourself. But it's also possible to do opportunity charging. Opportunity charging means that all the time when the battery is a little bit drained, like 5 or 10%, and we have to wait in a queue for a certain process, we can charge the lowpad over there. Yep. Under certain conditions, it is even possible to drive 24 hours per day when applying sufficient opportunity charging. Interesting. Um, the next question is, uh, how does the implementation look like in general? So what can we expect? Yeah, that's a very nice one, and actually one of the key USPs of a low pad. Namely, the low pad does not need a lot of building-related infrastructure. The only things we need is a power supply for the charges, a Wi-Fi network, and a nice floor. So how it usually works is that we advise a customer and we cooperate with the customer to find the best possible driving routes in an area. And when that's done, and the, the low pads are built, we arrive, and then we will take one low pad and drive that low pad around over the floor. We call this the mapping. So what it is doing, the floor-oriented camera is looking at the floor surface. It makes, the, as you explained, the fingerprints of the concrete. Yep. It's storing them. The LiDAR is looking at the objects which are on the floor. All of this information together is stored by just one low pad. When that's done, all the information is shooted up in the supervisor system. Supervisor transferred the information to the fleet of low pads which can arrive by that time. Now in supervisor, you can assign certain pathways as a driving pathway, single direction or under certain circumstances, a dual direction. You can assign a drop-off zone, a pick-up spot, a no-go zone, etc. This is also a system which we adjust depending on the customer needs. But you can imagine, if you have a certain floor layout and your operation is changing by the needs of the market or by the needs of production, you would have a wish to change your layout and your routing of the low pads. So that's quite straightforward. You change with an existing mapping only the driving routes within your floor. Did it answer the question? Yes, yeah. completely. Um, I told that the low is a collaborative robot. Um, but can you tell a bit more about the safety scanners? Does it make a sound? How does, how does that work? Yeah, fundamentally we don't like the sounds. The point is, if you look at a low pad system, um, a lot of our clients need more than 5, more than 10, even more than 50 or 100 low pads. You can imagine if all those vehicles would make a certain sound, even if the sound would be different, you would end up with an orchestra. Yeah. Well, some people like it, but not everybody likes the same style of music. So we decided a low pad should be silent. Because at the end of the day, when all of them are making noise, you're hearing none of them. So it's not contributing to your safety at all. We developed the low pad a different way. We said there is a safety sensor, which is in every low pad. So that safety sensor is a LiDAR system. It sees all the objects on the floor, and it recognizes them. If it is an object which is not teached, we know there is something else. So we have certain safety zones within that LiDAR. If you are approaching the end of a safety zone, the vehicle, the low pad, is slowing down. It doesn't beep, it only slows down. If you would enter very close before the low pad, it still tries to slow down, but if you are too close, it will go in an emergency and stop and needs a reboot. That's an obliged safety feature. You cannot manipulate with that. The low pad is a collaborative robot. It has a certified safety circuit inside the low pad. So this entire system is a kind of a dual system. The LiDAR is used for driving. It's used for um, the first approach on safety. But finally, when you are within his social distancing area, it gets alarming and it will stop. Okay, clear. Thank you. 
And the next question is more about the floor detection camera. So what about if there are spills on the floor? So he has mapped the floor, but somebody spills uh, something on it. How does the floor camera or the navigation system cope with this? Yeah, it's important to realize here that the LOPAD has several systems for navigation. The floor-oriented camera is one of them. The fusing of the sensor, so the odometry uh, is contributing to that, but it can also use the LiDAR. Now, what we have developed is a system where both the LiDAR and the floor-oriented camera together will pull the information and combine it with the odometry. So, if a floor camera would totally stop for a certain moment, it's not a problem. So, if you have a spill on the floor and it doesn't see a couple of points, there is no panic. The low pad will continue to drive on the odometry, but since there is always a little bit of slip on the wheels, um, or you can have a little angle difference, after a too long distance, it will get out of range. Then it will try to correct with the other systems, and if it is really too long, so it doesn't see any possibility to correct anymore, it will go and stop and ask for us for support. So. The floor-oriented camera is a fantastic system, but it's not the only system. Yeah, correct. And I think uh, we can remap the floor in case yeah. when there is a spillage. Uh, That's true. If there is a spillage and it um, appears that the spillage will be continuous over that floor, it is time to do a partial remapping of the floor. Good, thank you. Um, we have showed a small video about the Lopet F and I am really enthusiastic about it. But when is this Lopet F ready for sales? Yeah, we have already had one testing model uh, which we didn't like. So we built this model as a second model, but all the experience before was implemented. This Lopet F is now at the end of its testing phase and it is getting available for sales at the moment. That doesn't mean that we will supply this vehicle uh, before Christmas, so there is no wrap around it, no gift card uh, with it. Um, it will be um, from the end of Q2 next year, depending on the application and, of course, depending on the ordering moment. Okay, great. Um, can, uh, can you connect the low-pad software with external devices, like PLC, to open a door or uh, open a lift? How does that work? Yeah, basically, um, the LOPAD system has in the LOPAD navigator, and navigator is software in the LOPAD. Every individual LOPAD has navigator. Navigator uh, takes care for driving and for safety. So it's not the LOPAD which communicates. What is communicating is the layer above, supervisor. Now, supervisor has a standard API by which we communicate with external devices. And these can be uh, doors or elevator units or uh, other external signals. Oh. However, it's important that uh, the signals and what we should do after a signal is done is clear. So, for instance, if an elevator unit says us, tells us it's safe to drive in, but there is a stiff, deep hole of 10 meters, you will lose a low pad. Yep. Okay, clear. Um, Somebody has sent us a challenge, and it's quite an interesting one, and I'm sure, Bram, you have a great answer on it. He is about to set up a new logistic environment uh, with conveyor belts, but now he is doubting, and he thinks, why should I maybe use a LOPAD? Yeah, I could talk about that for days, uh, but I will try to condense it a little bit. <laughs> Good. Um, my answer may sound a bit biased, because we produce LOPADs. However, I mentioned to you at the beginning of this webinar that we are an equipment manufacturer. So, we ourselves are building a lot of conveyors as well. Now, there are horses for courses. Yep. If you need a transport and it's always coming here and leaving there, and it's always the same day, same transport, same amount, same sequence, same speed, why don't you use a conveyor? I wouldn't advise you a low bit for that. The moment, however, is, or the challenge, however, is different when you have feeding, maybe a buffer area in between, some exits over there, uh, different drop-off zones, that's different. So if you look at a warehouse integration of a system, 
we have been um, experienced that many, many users automated a fantastic production based on the information they had two years ago when they started their project. Yes. And very often, by the time the implementation is happening, it's already a little bit itchy because it gets out of date. The challenges uh, can still be overcome at that moment in most situations, but after a couple of years, it feels old. And now, the simple fact is that it is more difficult to change thousands of kilograms of steel compared to an AGV or an AMR system. With the AMR, basically what you do, you change the routing, or you change the load carrier, or you change the process sequence. Yep. These all are not possible if you have a warehouse uh, full of steel. Thank you. I think this guy has something to think about this weekend and probably will send me a call next week. Let's wait for that. Now, I hope for him. Yes. <laughs> uh, the last question is, of course, can you give an indication on the cost price? Yeah, that's always um, a question on the exhibition. You were often asked, uh, what's the cost of this system? And as I understand it, the question is not necessarily, what's the capital expenditure? Because basically, your capital expenditure doesn't tell you anything about your operational cost. So if I need to give a plain, straightforward answer in that, it is a low pad is costing you €3.50 per low pad per hour. However, it's not a total truth. The question is, how much, um, how much hours is this low pad utilized in one year? No. Uh, how productive is it? Depending on that, you will find that we often can advise customers in a payback time, uh, in a cost of ownership calculation. Uh, we often find that with two shifts, it is quite easy to have a payback time of about two years for a system. You need to be aware that uh, um, if you talk on the financials, often there is not a very quick payback. Some situations, yes, uh, and we find the amount is more than you would expect, but there is also many customers you don't see a quick payback. Now, the question I often ask them is, are you dying a slow death when your employee costs are increasing by the year, by inflation? And if you can't invoice that to your customers, your company is slowly getting down. The other question is, is it still possible to find employees? Yep. Somebody told me that the Netherlands is not too small, the Netherlands has not sufficient people to work. And I think for other countries this also applies. So when we should speak about cost, in the Netherlands we always ask, who will cost it? <laughs> I mean, we are Dutch, it's the first question we always ask ourselves. The answer is, we'll be very happy to support our clients to make a high over calculation to give them a first impression and say, well, this is about what you think about. If that's appealing, then we can dig a, a couple of layers deeper into that. Great. No more questions, Jonathan? No, uh, that, that's it. Okay, then I would like to thank you for asking the questions. I would like the entire team that has been working on this webinar. You did a great job. I would also like to thank everybody who attained this webinar. It was a true pleasure to inform you, to enlighten you about possibilities of a low pad. However, I think that you may have more questions than you had before. Because once if you start to think about the possibilities, and once if you start to ponder on the ideas, it is increasing, increasing and increasing. Well, that's not a problem. My colleagues are very happy to advise you and to help you please contact us at lopet.com. I think we are finished even before time, so most, most of us will even have an early start of the weekend. I hope all of you will enjoy. Thank you.